10. A local family continues its desperate search for new clues that can tell them how their sons died last summer. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining us tonight. For eight months, Ray and Kathy Kovalovog have continually asked the public for any information that could provide answers as to how their sons Zach and Connor died. Ray Kovalovog now says the only two people who can provide more information are the truck driver and the basketball coach, who says he saw the accident happen. Valley News Team's Cornelius Hawker reports on this developing story. We're here to even give him the reward money if he'll come and tell us how our, our two boys uh, crashed uh, on June 23rd. For months, the Kabalvogs have turned over every stone trying to determine what events led to the death of their sons, Zach and Connor. I don't expect people to understand that, that haven't lost a child in some fashion. Minnesota Highway Patrol says their diligent efforts helped them find the semi they believe was involved in the fatal crash. But now... The Cabalbox say they want to speak with their son's basketball coach, Josh Lee, seen here at the vigil for the teens on the day they died last summer. They say Lee's behavior in the moments and weeks after the crash don't add up. The head coach never does call 911, ever. Never calls 911, and he's the person who said he saw everything unfold. In his original testimony to the Highway Patrol, and that's what we all believed for two weeks, was that there was no semi involved in this accident at all. None. Ray Kabalvog says the discrepancies continue on top of the fact Lee, according to the Kabalvogs, refuses to speak with them. The head basketball coach, uh, uh, Josh Lee, says that they were, the, that my son had braked prior to the accident in the black box data in the Dodge truck says he never braked. We reached out to Lee for comment but didn't hear back from him. Many people in our community want to know why the Kabalvovs continue pressing for more answers. Ray tells them why. It's, it's killing us not knowing how this happened. You keep on it until you get the answer. And if you never get it, you don't. But you never stop. Ray tells me this isn't a witch hunt against Park Christian School. He says he knows his sons are in a better place and gives some credit to the school for that. He just wishes basketball coach Josh Lee would speak with him and his wife, Andrea. All right, thank you, Cornelius. If there are any new developments in this story, we'll be sure to update you on air and online. Now on to a Valley News Live exclusive tonight. We have exclusive body camera video from the Grand Forks Police Department as they rushed into Walmart last May following a deadly shooting. Minutes before the Grand Forks SWAT team swarmed the Walmart store, 21-year-old Grand Forks Airman Marcel Willis was caught on surveillance video walking into the store. Within seconds, he shot and killed one employee, wounded another, and then shot and killed himself. I got one woman three walking in from the front door. I've got another woman who's been shot. Looks like a shoulder wound. Uh, African American male, black, uh, red shirt. It looks like a gunshot wound to the head. We have more body camera video from that Grand Forks shooting online. Just go to valleynewslive.com and click on this story. A Fargo man is facing several charges after police say they clocked him going 140 miles per hour on his motorcycle on I-94 earlier this afternoon. Police say 22-year-old Tanner Bailey of Fargo is driving 140 miles per hour in a 75 mile per hour zone. A state trooper located the driver on Cass County Road 10 on the west edge of West Fargo. He was cited for speeding, aggravated reckless driving, driving without liability insurance, and driving without a motorcycle endorsement. We're learning more tonight about the man who went on a deadly shooting spree in a factory in Kansas. Four people are dead, including the shooter, Cedric Ford, and 14 people are wounded. Ford has a 20-year criminal history. He's a felon charged with burglary, grand theft, and carrying a concealed weapon. Authorities say the attacks began shortly after they served him with a restraining order telling him to stay away from his former girlfriend, who claimed he abused her, was alcoholic, violent, and depressed. Senator Bernie Sanders made his second trip to Minnesota just ahead of the state's presidential caucuses. The presidential candidate met with tribal leaders in Hibbing before holding a rally in a high school gym. For the first time in Minnesota, Sanders publicly criticized Hillary Clinton Sanders telling the crowd that he led the charge against the Iraq war while Hillary Clinton voted for it. He added that the super PAC that supports Clinton accepted $15 million in Wall Street donations, money that he said will come with favors if Clinton is elected. He also blasted Clinton for supporting NAFTA, a trade policy that cost the United States hundreds of thousands of manufacturing jobs. 
Sanders questioned whether Clinton would continue to oppose the TPP, a trade deal that many steel workers on the range oppose. The other focus of Sanders' speech here was the layoff on the Iron Range. And I do understand what's going on up here in the Iron Range about the loss of many, many, many hundreds of good paying jobs because cheap Chinese steel is being dumped into the United States of America. Minnesota is one of 12 states with voters going to the polls on what's called Super Tuesday. A march is scheduled to support Sanders and Moorhead tomorrow. You can find more details on that on our website, valleynewslive.com. 84 cases of pertussis have recently been confirmed in the state of Minnesota. Three of those cases are in Clay County and one in Ottertail County. Valley News Team's Natalie Parsons spoke with Clay County Public Health about the infection and shares some tips to prevent it. Pertussis, or whooping cough, is a bacterial infection in the lungs of young children, but people of all ages can get it. It starts as a cold with sneezing, running nose, and a light cough, and later develops into a hard cough. When I say hard coughing, it's not unusual for them to actually induce vomiting in themselves from the hard cough, and it can go on for weeks. They can get quite sick. Clay County Public Health says pertussis can be dangerous, but it is treatable with a five-day course of antibiotics. The trial will still be contagious until the medication is finished. When they're coughing, they're spreading droplets of um, you know, droplets into the air with bacteria, and that's what causes other people to catch the disease. Children can be immunized against the illness as early as two months old, and booster shots are later available. Anderson recommends washing your hands, coughing into your sleeve, and distance yourself from anyone who may be sick. Make sure that you're getting plenty of rest. Make sure you're keeping yourself well. Um, if, if they do get sick and have pertussis-like symptoms, then they should seek the care of their medical provider. Anderson adds there is no immediate threat right now in our community in contracting the infection, but does say you should use preventative measures. Natalie Parsons, Valley News Live. There have been no reported cases of pertussis in Cass County. Get used to it. That's the bottom line for passengers who have been complaining about longer wait times to go through security at Minneapolis-St. Paul International Airport after the recent implementation of a new condensed system. Travelers were active today on social media posting pictures of security lines that stretched the length of Terminal 1. They even sent messages about the potential of missing flights, and it's all because of increased security screenings. Screeners are focusing more on alarm resolutions, passenger pat-downs, and x-ray bag screenings. The TSA is telling passengers to arrive two hours before your flight leaves to ensure that you have enough time to park Get your boarding passes, check your baggage, and growth, go through security checkpoints. There's a mad dash to get everything off the ice before it gets even warmer. But once that happens, there's still a lot of work to be done before the ice out. Dylan Wollenhouse follows along for some spring cleaning on the lakes. Perhaps one good thing about a short season on the ice is the limited amount of work Gabriel Jabor will do cleaning up the mess that sometimes is left behind. Well, last year was a bad year on the water and on the ice. And I think there's quite a bit uh, consciousness through social media about preserving the lake. For more than 40 years, he's lived near Tonka Bay on Lake Minnetonka. He's also on the lake's conservation district. Veterans Bay, a corner typically packed this time of year, anglers have all but abandoned it just days before the deadline for houses to be off the lakes. It's extremely great and exciting to see there's absolutely no garbage left behind. Let's talk about this. Minnesota, the land of 10,000 lakes, it's our tagline. We take pride in that. So do we really need to be reminded to clean up after ourselves out on the ice? Evidence points to yes. Here's just a sample of what the DNR has pulled from Minnesota lakes in recent years after the March deadline for houses to be off. Makeshift houses left behind, remnants of a fire pit, and plots littered with trash. You know, there's ID on shelter, so we document that ID identification. We take pictures of this, take GPS waypoints of where these shelters are located, and then they go back and uh, take a look at the lakes again to see if that trash has been picked up or not. Mother Nature has robbed us this season of what we may know as typical winter, and even as the ice fades, what's left on it won't. On Lake Minnetonka, Dylan Woolenhouse, Care 11 News.